Hello, hello. My name is Austin, and this is part two in a video series that is going to summarize Carl Olaf Johnson's book, The Gentile Times Reconsidered. In our last video, we learned how four Jehovah's Witnesses, identity, purpose, and a sense of urgency are all tied to beliefs about 1914. And we also summarized the interpretations and the calculations that Jehovah's Witnesses used to get the 1914 date. Chapter one of Johnson's book is titled The History of an Interpretation. And to begin this chapter, Johnson points out that there's a kind of relative value of thinking about where ideas come from. He says, true, knowledge of the historical development of an idea does not necessarily disprove it but such knowledge does enable us to improve our judgment of its validity. And that's basically right. I'll just add that there are two common logical fallacies that we are going to try to avoid when thinking about this topic. The ad hominem fallacy and what's called poisoning the well. The ad hominem logical fallacy says you can't trust a source of information because of other unrelated, perceived faults or flaws in that source. In other words, you're attacking the person, not their ideas. Poisoning the well is similar, but it says that you can't trust this source because other ideas they've presented have turned out to not be true. Therefore, you can't trust any truth claim that that source is making. And that's wrong. For instance, Isaac Newton, just because he was wrong about alchemy, that doesn't mean that he was also wrong about his theory of universal gravitation. In any case, it's easy to fall into this kind of reasoning, and we're going to do our best to avoid these kinds of arguments when thinking about the history of prophetic interpretation as it relates to Jehovah's Witnesses. Rather, we're trying to think about the method of interpretation that's been used here, how this method has been exhibited collectively, examples of this method of interpretation, and how this all leads up to Charles Taze Russell's ideas about prophecy. If you've watched part one, you're already familiar with how Jehovah's Witnesses arrive at the date 1914, and you'll know that the seven times in Daniel, four witnesses, indicate an interval or a time when God's kingdom would be suppressed and then reemerge at the end. And that figure, seven times, it's not a self-explanatory figure. At least, not if you believe that this text refers to something beyond its immediate context. That is, if you think it has a larger fulfillment. And so, to understand the seven times of Daniel in a way that can fit onto a chronological timeline, you have to follow a formula. And we walked through that in our last video, but if you'll remember, you get to a point where you're stuck because 2,520 days doesn't actually get you a prediction. And that's when we turn to Numbers and Ezekiel. And we decided that these texts were stating a general principle of prophetic interpretation. And of course, the text itself doesn't say this, but in any case, this concept of interpreting days in prophetic texts as years and justifying this by turning to these scriptures. It's called the year-day principle. This interpretive key is essential to making this kind of eschatological speculation work. For an example, you have days that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 8 and 12, and for prophetic interpreters, these dates don't seem to have any kind of literal significance until around the late Middle Ages. And then you have various Jewish and Christian expositors claiming that there's a date coming in the not too distant future that these numbers are pointing to. Johnson gives us this table outlining attempts to apply this so-called year day principle to the 1,260 days from Revelation 12. And you do see a few monastic figures in the 11th to the 14th centuries using this interpretive strategy, it starts to see an uptick around the Reformation in the 16th century. Christians are seeing massive shifts in power in the church and in governments around Europe, 
And this, along with other factors, creates some interest in how time prophecies could potentially play in to what they're seeing going on around them. Before we keep moving along, we need to note how these interpreters are thinking about scripture, the way they're thinking about prophecy. The way that they're approaching the text can be called concordism. Concordism, as I'm using it here, takes cryptic expressions from prophetic texts and interprets them as corresponding tightly to a particular event in the past, the present, or the future. But when you're doing this sort of interpretation, you run into two problems. Problem one is fixing the event that will serve as a starting point. In particular, if you are trying to interpret a time prophecy, which will have a starting point, an interval, and a terminal point, you have to start by thinking about what your starting point event is. So you're going to tie a particular phrase from scripture to an event. Problem two is that interpreters using this method have to then date the event that they're thinking of so that they can place that event on the starting point of an interval. Sometimes these interpreters simply don't have access to the historical data that we have today. However, for others, they seem to just be ignoring the data that's available to them, or they didn't have an interest. They weren't incentivized into looking into this data. In any case, Johnson will describe how the French Revolution and Napoleon's forces capturing the Pope would fuel eschatological speculation. In fact, some writers predicted this event by applying the 1,260 days of Revelation 12 and the year-day principle, and then fixing a start date in the past and lining it up with the beginning of the sack of Rome by the French in 1798, and claiming that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. This date, 1798, actually becomes somewhat cemented within certain circles of the evangelical Protestant world because the French Revolution had such an impact on European life, society, government, and culture. So when thinkers in the 19th century, especially thinkers within a certain milieu, reflect on that event, they are thinking about history unfolding in a sort of apocalyptic way. It creates excitement about what the time prophecy method, the concordist method, the year-day principle could yield when they turn to the Bible. Johnson then notes the work of an early 19th century historian, John Aquila Brown. Brown's work ends up being pretty significant for a number of reasons, one of which is that he uses the year-day principle to predict that Christ will return in 1844. And this date ends up being very significant for certain groups later on. But for the purposes of our study, Johnson shows that he speculates in his book called The Even Tide that the seven times of Daniel 4 could be calculated to mean 2,520 years. In other words, he's the first thinker who goes to the book of Revelation to find the interpretive key that gets you this result, 2,520 years. His work on prophecy ends up getting fairly broadly circulated among certain circles in the U.S. and England. Now, through 1826 through 1830, there was an annual conference on prophetic interpretation. It was held in Albury, which is south of London, England, and it was chaired by a parish priest of Albury, and the attendees were various thinkers of a similar Christian eschatological perspective. And during these conferences, they're thinking about the text in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, where Jesus says that Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are completed. Jesus is saying that non-Jews are going to have possession of Jerusalem during a period of time. Some from the Albury conferences 
are starting to associate this expression from Jesus with Daniel chapter 4. And others are connecting it to Daniel 8. There's expressions in Daniel 8 about the sanctuary. They understand this is the temple being cleansed after a certain period. But some, like I said, are connecting it with the tree dream. Just a few years later, in 1837, an official who worked for St. Mark's Church in Brighton, England, Edward Bishop Elliot, he writes this massive work on eschatology called The Hours of the Apocalypse. He's bringing together numerous resources on chronology and then fixing these dates to see how they related to time prophecies. And it's actually a massively popular work at the time. And in an offhanded remark, in an early edition of his work, he actually connects the 1914 date with the seven times of Daniel 4 and the 2520 year period. He says in the quote, of course, if calculated from Nebuchadnezzar's own accession and invasion of Judah, BC 606, the end is much later, being AD 1914. Now, you'll notice he's doing something different from Russell. He's actually almost got the right date for the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. He's only off by one year. Russell is going to create this calculation much differently. He actually thinks that 606 is the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. But this is an example of someone using the same method of calculation to come to the date of 1914. Now, Eliot's work as a whole will make connections that end up influencing not C.T. Russell so much, but the crowd that he ran in. And these Christians that C.T. Russell associated with in his young years, this movement you could call in broad terms the Adventists, sometimes referred to as the Second Advent Movement. The Adventists are characterized by a certain set of ideas within the more radical wings of Protestantism, but especially they have an interest in eschatological speculation and even in some cases a kind of alarmism. The forerunner of this movement was a preacher by the name of William Miller. Miller was a deist in his teen years, but then he has a conversion experience after he was exposed to some of these ideas around eschatology. Afterward, he becomes a Baptist preacher and ends up making tours around America with his chart. This chart actually ends up becoming rather iconic in some segments of American culture. William Miller and many others who followed his ideas toured American churches and gave presentations of how Miller's calculations revealed that Jesus would be returning in 1844. And you'll notice on this chart some numbers that should be familiar to us. You'll notice he's actually using the 2,520 day calculation, but his start date is the capture of King Manasseh by the Assyrians. So he's using in this chart as a whole supposedly independent lines of evidence from scripture that produce the 1843-1844 date. And this idea, this idea that Christ is going to be coming back in 1844 becomes a very widespread belief. In fact, some have calculated that as many as 1 in 16 Americans believe that Jesus was going to return in 1843. And of course, he doesn't appear in 1843. And that whole ordeal becomes known as the Great Disappointment. And while these predictions ended up not coming to fruition, Miller had developed quite the following, who had formed some quasi-communities who followed his ideas. Some started to speculate that Jesus perhaps did, in fact, come in 1844, but it was a kind of spiritual coming, an invisible presence, a rulership in the hearts of the faithful. This maneuver, where leaders in these movements claim that they expected the wrong thing at the right time, it's going to become a familiar one to us, as we'll see. Miller's followers end up breaking into various camps, 
who end up proposing various alternative dates for the return of Christ on various grounds. Some would say that Miller had merely interpreted the passage incorrectly. Christ came invisibly in 1844, even though Miller was expecting a physical coming of Christ. Others said that he had simply miscalculated the original event in history. The start date was incorrect. You can see there's problem one and problem two. What was the interpretation of scripture? What should it have been? Or what is the correct date for the event in history? Either way, Adventists gravitated toward further eschatological speculation, even after the Great Disappointment. Some within Adventist circles tended toward a more traditional and conservative doctrinal understanding. Some were a bit more experimental. And this ends up becoming like an island of lost toys, the Adventist circles. They're Bible believers, but they also found communion in people who took a somewhat non-traditional perspective. At least, this is non-traditional for most Christians. For instance, some are publishing work, objecting to traditional views of the deity of Christ and of the doctrine of hell. One man who was well known for publishing these sorts of views was George Storrs. If you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, this name might be familiar to you. The Watchtower frequently credits Storrs as being a sort of forerunner to C.T. Russell. However, they don't often mention that Storrs didn't just share ideas that were similar to Charles Taze Russell, but that George Storrs very directly influenced C.T. Russell. Storrs published a magazine called Bible Examiner. After Russell had become disillusioned with traditional Reformed Christian teaching, he encountered the preaching of Adventists, such as Jonas Wendell, starting around the year 1870. Young Russell eventually became a co-editor of George Storrs' journal, The Bible Examiner, which means that Storrs and his associates were in direct contact with Russell, and they're working out some of these ideas together through the pages of Storrs' journal. While Storrs and the Adventist movement would give C.T. Russell some categories and a community to think through his own interpretations of basic Bible doctrine, perhaps the greatest influence on him and on his life would come not through stores, but through a man named Nelson Barber. And in our next video, we will learn about his story and the deep impact he had on the life of a young Charles Taze Russell.